Well, good morning. Thank you for your time today. We are always grateful to be able to connect with you all. My name is Bruce Anthony, and I'm one of the trainers with Service Technologies. Now, before we jump right in, I wanted to point out that I have several colleagues on the call today who can answer your questions via the chat function. You should see uh, kind of neither hand raising icon, a question mark icon. So please, please feel free to ask away throughout the webinar. They'll answer your questions directly, but they'll also let me know of any questions they think would be helpful for the entire group. I also want to note that if you have to leave before you receive a response, our customer support team will reach out to you after the webinar. And we'll look at this again at the end, but I always like to point out that all of our past recorded webinars are available if you go to video.servicetech.com or if you just go to YouTube and search for service technologies. You can find playlists on here on different topics, as well as if you click into the videos tab, you can see all of our past videos sorted with most recent. And with that, let's jump into it. Today we'll be discussing volunteer onboarding, which is converting prospective volunteers into active volunteers. And the best way to do that is by having a clear and efficient path for your volunteers to follow. Now, there are times where this interaction will be accomplished by sending direct links to volunteers or by posting QR codes on flyers for volunteers to scan. But for the vast majority of volunteer connections, this will take place by some interaction on your website or the standalone console. Within service, there are several pages that you can use for your volunteer onboarding process, kind of depending on your needs. And of course, Every organization is different, and I'd encourage you, as we're discussing, to apply the lens of your process to what we're covering today. So let's talk through a few examples of how different organizations handle volunteer onboarding and how that affects what you should be doing with your website and how you direct your volunteers. So let's start off with a pretty simple example. If your events that you're posting uh, don't really require any sort of vetting or restrictions or possibly maybe just age restrictions, and you just want volunteers to kind of directly sign up for what you have posted, then you can send volunteers to a page like your event listing page. You might not even need to apply any uh, restrictions or filters to a page like this. Now you can always use a standalone version of service like what we're looking at right now. But what I want to focus on today is the idea of integrating service into your website to kind of simplify how volunteers engage with service and where you're directing them. It's often a lot easier to tell someone to go to your website. You probably know the URL by heart and the volunteer might already know it as well. So it's a lot easier to direct people to your website rather than to a standalone page for, uh, you know, your console. Or you might have to send them a specific link. Um, but if you have a pretty simple registration process, like a direct registration process, you know, you can send volunteers to a page like this. Uh, they can just locate the event that they're interested in. Once they click to learn more about it, they can read about that event and then just pick to sign up for an event. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, in the standard workflow that is a volunteer signing up for an event, uh, the on a page like this, I'm not yet logged in. So a volunteer wouldn't log in first. When they click on this sign up option, that'll take them to an account check page. Now it remembers me because I was logged in previously, but if it was a new volunteer or a new user, it'll take them to this account check page, which asks for their email address and first name. And it's just verifying whether or not this person already has an account. If they do, it'll ask for their password. If they don't, it'll have them create a new profile as a part of the registration process. So that kind of does play into where you're sending volunteers and what you need them to do. So again, let's go back to this example of a very pretty simple implementation. And simple doesn't mean bad, right? Simple just means that you don't necessarily have extra hoops that a volunteer might need to jump through. So if you just need a volunteer to register for events kind of directly, then you can embed a page like this where you just have your events posted. So let's take a look at an example of that. So this is a page where I just have my events posted and a volunteer can go through here and just sign up for whatever they're interested in. Now there's things that volunteers can do on this page. They can click on some of my tags or my stickers here to apply filters. Maybe they only wanna look at events that are good for families. You know, they can click on a tag like that and filter by that kind of information. 
Um, but generally speaking, I don't necessarily need to give my volunteers extra steps in this kind of scenario because I just want them to pick what they're interested in and sign up. I think this works best if you have kind of a singular focus as an organization in terms of how many different types of programs you offer or how many different locations you operate out of. If you're pretty simple in the in the fact that you are kind of interacting with one specific group of volunteers doing one sort of task, you know, maybe there's some variation within that. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, if you don't have a ton of events posted and you're not sending people all over the place, then just putting your event listing page on your website can oftentimes be enough. Now let's kind of talk through a couple other routes that you might go. So let's say you, uh, you know, are pretty simple in your implementation, how you need volunteers to sign up, but perhaps you have multiple different locations that you operate out of. Well, it might be best to send someone to a page, not just showing all of your events, but maybe to ask someone first to pick where they'd like to work. So you might send someone to kind of a landing page that has multiple different locations listed. And when someone finds the location that they're interested in working at, they can click on a button associated with that and that would take them to a page that filters by that location. So in this case, there's kind of a hidden filter being applied here by, in this case, Colorado Springs is what I clicked on. So now I'm not viewing all of my events, just the ones in Colorado Springs, right? So if you are, again, kind of a simple implementation in that sense, uh, and you just need volunteers to pick where they wanna work first, then you could use a page like this where you're filtering by a location. And we're going to drill down into kind of the technical aspect here and how to accomplish something like this a little bit later. But really the point I want to drive through right now is kind of deciding where to start, you know, how to send your volunteers initially and what kind of makes the most sense in terms of how you break out your volunteers. So this is another example, right? Sending people by location uh, or picking by location. Another very common uh, example or very similar example would be filtering volunteers by what program they're interested in. You know, maybe you are working out of one specific location, but you have a wide variety of programs that volunteers could interact with. Uh, you might do a very similar page where you're having volunteers select between different program names or the different types of jobs that you offer. And when they click on one of those buttons, it's not filtering now by a location, but instead it's filtering by that particular program. Now in my example, so my demonstration console, both of those filters are accomplished by interest categories. There are other ways to do this too, using tags, and we'll kind of drill down into the specifics and the technical aspect of that a little bit later. Um, but both of those implementations are pretty common in terms of how you might ask volunteers to pick what they're interested in signing up for. Uh, now, one thing to kind of note about this and something that I like to think through as I'm doing or implementing an integration like this is uh, how can I ask my volunteers to make sort of small incremental decisions? So how can you ask volunteers to not pick between everything that you have posted immediately, but to decide, you know, where they wanna work or what they'd like to do? And now once I've picked, you know, where I wanna work, or in this case, I picked a program, I chose the warehouse, now I can see, okay, there's two different events available. And I can see, you know, if I click into this one, it shows me all the times, right? So I'm kind of making incremental decisions. You know, I'm clicking through the program that I want to work on, then the event name, and then the actual date and time. So that's kind of how I typically like to send my volunteers uh, through the signup process is to have them make uh, incremental decisions and not have to see everything all at once. Now, there are things volunteers can do to apply filters on their own. And for some of your volunteers, that'll be great. And they'll go and do that themselves. They'll apply those filters. They'll know how to do that kind of thing. And of course, you can also allude to that. Uh, but generally speaking, and for the vast majority of volunteers, I think it's better to direct their steps by having them make small choices uh, as they're going through this process. Okay, so we've talked through a couple pretty simple examples. You might just have all your events posted. Maybe you direct people's steps by what program they're interested in or by what location they're interested in. But what if your programs require approval processes? You know, what if you have some application processes in place, you need people to pass background checks, you need to vet every single registrations, you know, those kinds of situations, you might just need to amend this process a little bit. And it really kind of depends on what your onboarding looks like or what it entails, 
how much kind of back and forth you have in terms of scheduling interviews or conducting reference checks or background checks or things like that. Um, but a lot of times it's gonna look pretty similar. It's just going to depend on what restrictions you have in place on your events and how you communicate those to volunteers. Whenever you place a restriction in service, Something that you can choose to do, and I'd encourage you to do almost every time, is you can set a custom failure message. So I just went in to add a new opportunity here. And if we scroll down to registration restrictions, you can set restrictions in service by a number of different fields, including things like checklist items, like whether or not someone has completed a certain training or certification, uh, different things like that. But most of these restrictions aren't going to tell the volunteer why they don't meet the requirements if they get rejected. The exceptions to that are age and gender. So if you have an age restriction in place and someone doesn't meet that requirement, it will tell them there's an age requirement. Um, but for anything else, like you might have a training requirement or some kind of background check or uh, some kind of vetting process in place, if we scroll down to the bottom of the restriction section, you can set a failure message. So when a volunteer doesn't meet the requirements, this is what language they'll see. There is a default failure message. It's pretty generic. It basically just tells the volunteer that they don't meet the requirements and that they should contact an admin for more information. But I almost always recommend editing this if you have restrictions in place that you can apply more or give more context to. Like for example, if you have a training that a volunteer has to complete first, well, they might not be aware of that. You might have laid it out in the description of the event, which I would encourage you to do as well, uh, but people don't always read everything. And so having that listed in another place, like in the rejection uh, or the failure message, I think is a good thing to do. It's a good practice to get into. That way you're kind of always helping people to pick what they should be doing and what they should be moving toward, as opposed to just rejecting them flat out. So that's kind of just a good practice to get into if you have restrictions you need to set on your events. Um, but like I said, you might also have an approval process in place where you want to accept applications for something and then vet volunteers on the back of that before they're approved for that program. And that's a pretty common way to engage with volunteers as well, depending on what type of program it is. Uh, so for example, we have in our demonstration console a coaching program. Um, so you might ask volunteers to kind of apply to be uh, you know, a coach or a reading mentor or something like that. These are set up in my system as service projects. And even if you're not letting volunteers record hours directly into a service project, which is typically how they're used, you can just use a service project to kind of capture applications. You know, if someone's interested in becoming a reading mentor in my system, they have to apply through this project. And when they actually apply for this project, there are some custom registration questions in place as well that I don't normally have other volunteers answer, right? So things that are unique to this particular project, which is one of the benefits of using service projects to collect some applications. So even if you don't think that you should post your events because you don't have any publicly posted events, right? You, all of your events are hidden. Maybe you have very specific private information in your events that you don't want volunteers to see until they've been approved you can still post generic service projects that function as kind of capturing applications or capturing interest based on those particular programs that you have going on. So even in the case where, uh, you know, you might be tempted to think that I just want to collect applications like on the general volunteer application, sometimes this is appropriate, uh, but sometimes it can be better to split up and create separate service projects uh, that volunteers can kind of indicate interest in, especially if you need to collect information that's unique to those particular projects, like someone applying for an internship might need to answer some questions that someone applying for a coaching program wouldn't need to. Um, and you can use custom registration questions to lay out how those questions are asked um, and basically have that information collected when people apply. Uh, the benefit of doing that too is then people that get added to buckets. So you kind of have buckets of individuals and you can go through those applications uh, and vet those volunteers, you know, kind of as you need to. So that's kind of another example of how you might direct volunteer steps. I have one more home page that I want to show you as an example. So when you're sending volunteers to like a landing page on your website initially, you might send them to something like this 
where you have new volunteers click on a certain button, existing volunteers click on a certain button, maybe new groups click on a certain button. Um, these can direct to different pages in service. So in all three of these cases, these are going different places. Uh, sometimes this new volunteers, like we just discussed, might be best to actually go to your event listing page and maybe just filter to kind of your general application projects. Uh, in my case, I'm sending people to the, the direct application. So someone would just create a profile when they click on that link, they're just signing up to create an, to create an account. Um, but there's different ways to use that and different kind of ideas here. But this goes back to what I was talking about earlier where I'm directing volunteer steps. I'm having them take incremental decisions. You know, someone lands on this page and they would, you know, click on either new volunteer, existing volunteer or new group. They're kind of making a decision by doing that. And then I'm filtering what they're seeing based on that information. So another way that you can simplify kind of the process that your volunteers are engaging with or how they're seeing your events is by changing the language and the instructions that you have listed. Uh, sometimes it can be very tempting to include a lot of instructions on a page like this, you know, telling someone all the different steps that they need to take as they're walking through this, you know, click on an event and click on this and sign up here or go here first and create a profile and then come back here and create, a, you know, select an event. But oftentimes that can just muddy the waters. Uh, I think it's typically best practice in my experience to just post your events and allow volunteers to click into them themselves and then click through and register. So cleaning up your kind of instructions and the language that you have around a page like this, not asking volunteers to read a bunch of steps before they click into your events, um, I think often it leads to better outcomes because your volunteers don't really have room to interpret things differently, right? In this case, a volunteer just clicks into an event. They can read through the description of that event, which might tell them what steps are coming next. Like if you're going to be sending back uh, a background check or contacting references or something like that. Uh, but they're basically just clicking through the buttons on this page and following the prompts. So when they click sign up again, it's going to take them to the account check page. They'll put their information in here and then they'll either log in or create a new profile, but they didn't need to know that ahead of time. The system is sort of checking that as they go. So editing the language surrounding your different pages and how you're directing volunteer steps is also a pretty important aspect to this. Um, you know, not necessarily including too much instruction. You'll notice on basically all of my home pages, I don't have any real instruction. I'm just asking people to select a location. I'd probably provide a little bit more language here, asking them to pick what city they want to work in, you know, just something simple like that. Uh, but in this case, you know, I don't necessarily need a lot of instructions to be listed on a page like this to have someone know kind of what they're supposed to do. Now, the language you see throughout service uh, and the different fonts and colors and things like that to match your website, that can all be done in the system configuration. So when you are logged into your account on the admin side, if you want to change something like what we were just looking at, the intro text to that opportunity listing page, that's done in the system configuration. So under system management, go into edit system configuration. And in here, there's a couple sections I wanna point out. The first one is page content. And that contains things like your event listing page welcome message, which is that intro paragraph at the top of the event listing page. You can also edit the header of that page if you wanna change that language, uh, kind of change how that's displayed to volunteers. And again, that's this language here, so this header and then this welcome message. And obviously you are more than welcome to edit this. I'd encourage you to do so uh, just to make that kind of match your branding. But I would also encourage you not to necessarily include too many instructions in a section like this. Okay, so that section contains a lot of those welcome messages. And then I also wanna point out just while we're in here, um, there is a section called system appearance at the bottom of the system configuration. And this contains things like your logos, as well as all the colors in service. So if you wanna have that match your website more directly, all those colors can be edited through here. Um, and then there's also just different form styles and things like that, as well as the system-wide font uh, down towards the bottom. Okay, and then I like to point out too, if you don't see the font that you'd like to use through here, submit a ticket. Um, we use Google Fonts, but if you submit a ticket using or referencing kind of what font you want to use, 
they'll let you know whether or not that's accessible and if there's any uh, similar fonts that might work. Okay, so just kind of going back to this idea, um, I want to just sort of reiterate, and I think it's important when you're thinking about your volunteer process um, to think through what kind of decisions you could have your volunteers make sort of incrementally, whether it's by program or by location, or if you don't need to do that at all and you just need volunteers to go and pick the shift and sign up for that directly. I think a lot of times that's a totally appropriate solution. You don't necessarily need an intermediary step. Uh, unless you do want to have some of that kind of extra decision making done by your volunteers. Now there are other filters that can be applied on a page like this. So I have some other examples I just wanna show you through here. Um, so for example, we could just go straight to the application page if we wanted to send a volunteer to that page. We could go straight to the volunteer login page if you wanna send volunteers there. Um, there's also a calendar view version of the event listing page. And for some organizations, this might be exactly what you want. Uh, you don't want volunteers to see you know, the names of the events, you just want them to pick what date they want to work. Uh, when a volunteer clicks on a date on this calendar, it will filter to that date and then they can see the opportunities occurring and they can just click to sign up directly through there. Um, so this is kind of another version of that event listing page which you could start out with. You know, This might be the page that you directly send volunteers to initially. right? Uh, there's a couple other filters you can apply as well though. You can filter by tags. So I mentioned earlier that I was filtering by interest categories for my location and program kind of based pages. Uh, but you can also filter by tags, which volunteers can do as well if you make a tag into a sticker and make that searchable. But either way on the back end, you can kind of set that up as an initial uh, link. So I have a button here for family friendly events and that just searches for all the events that have that tag. You can also create a search based on a zip code radius. So you could filter to uh, all of your events within a radius of a, of a certain zip code. And that'll bring up a map like this that volunteers can interact with. So each of these pins represents your different events. And if they click on that pin, it'll take them straight to that particular event. So that's kind of another way to have volunteers interact with your events is by pulling up a map like that. Again, these are things volunteers can manually search for, but I find that it's typically best if you want, pe if you want people to see this right off the bat to actually kind of build it in uh, for them. So I just have a generic label here, zip code radius. If I was doing this uh, legitimately, I might do it on like a, uh, this like location home page. And then I would do a radius around each of these different cities, like a zip code in the middle of the city. And then that would pull up that page with the map already brought up and then the pins available for volunteers to click on. Uh, you can also direct people specifically to a certain event. So you might have like a special event over the holidays and you want to prop up sort of a page for that. You could send people straight to that specific event. Um, you don't necessarily have to have people click into the to your event listing page and then click into the event. Um, another example of this might actually be so uh, you might have seen on this previous page that I have an event called new volunteer orientation. Um, and what you might choose to do is on like a landing page instead of having your new volunteers button go to an application page. This could go straight to your orientation event. So you're asking people to just go and sign up for an orientation if they're a new volunteer. Um, so that's kind of another way to handle that sort of interaction as well. Uh, just sending people to an event like that directly. But again, that also works with any kind of special event, things like that. And then there are a couple other forms that you can post to. We don't need to dig into these too much right now unless there's questions about that. But the group request form, for example, is a way for groups to interact with you. Um, in my example homepage, that's where the, this kind of leads for groups. If they click on that, they can then fill out this information, give me their group name, their contact info, and sort of get a foot in the door for that sort of relationship. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, we do have a webinar on groups specifically that walks through kind of how to do this interaction. But of course, that can be embedded into a website as well. And then also the project request form, same kind of idea. This isn't used necessarily as frequently, but this would be uh, a separate form where volunteers can uh, submit to you an idea for an event or project. So that's kind of another uh, type of interaction you can have with volunteers. Okay. So yeah, the main kind of idea though behind any of this type of 
uh, interface on your website is to send volunteers to a page where they don't even necessarily have to know, you know, that they're interacting with service at this point. They're on your website. Uh, they're engaging with the events uh, or just the event that you want them to engage with uh, and how to, you know, I interact or kind of zone in on what you want them to be directed to specifically. And all of these interactions are taking place on, uh, you know, your website. Now, in my example that we're looking at right now, I want to be very clear. This is an example that I have created in Squarespace. There's nothing very service unique about this, apart from the fact that this is integrating, you know, the iframe here. Uh, but on the right hand side, all these buttons, these are not service specific. These are things that I've created using different filtering options. So I kind of walked through some of these options here. Um, I want to invite you, if you'd like to play around with this page, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, uh, you can you know, click through these buttons and all that sort of stuff and kind of poke around here if you'd like. Uh, just make sure that you are logged out of your account when you're looking at this. But again, just to point out all these buttons over here, these are not service specific. These are things that I've created just as an example. Um, and so doing filters by things like location or program or by tags or different radius or uh, radii around zip codes, things like that. I'll get into how to create these filters towards the end here today. I don't wanna dig into that technical information quite yet, um, but if you wanna play around with this, you're more than welcome to do so. But this is all kind of the idea of, you know, integrating service into your website and then directing someone's steps of what they actually see and interact with. Um, that's kind of the purpose of a page like this in terms of how you filter things and how you're directing volunteers. So we'll come back to how to generate these types of filters in a little bit, but I do wanna talk about some other ways that you might reach out to volunteers in certain circumstances um, where it might not be sending a volunteer to your website. Uh, instead, you might be sending someone to uh, you know, like a direct link, or perhaps you have a flyer that you want to post somewhere and invite volunteers to sign up for an event that way. That's kind of another way for you to interact with volunteers that isn't just your website. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, when you are logged into your admin console, you'll see if we go into manage events that every single opportunity, if we click into view opportunity details or preview opportunity de details here, down towards the bottom, there are direct link options. And these are ways to invite volunteers to see and sign up for an event. Um, so if you are, for example, creating a private event that you wanna invite volunteers to, you would use your private registration code. If we click on this link here, there's two different options. And these are basically just a way for you to invite someone to sign up for an event that is not publicly posted. Uh, this, the two different links here basically do the exact same thing. There's just a short version and a long version, and you can either copy the link and send that out, or you can also use uh, these QR codes. So you can generate a QR code directly within that page just by clicking on that icon there, and then you can right click this and save the image or copy it and put it on a flyer or something like that. Uh, and this would basically send someone straight to the registration page for that event. So there are a lot of cases where you might not want to send volunteers to your website. You want to send them straight to the sign up for this uh, event, you know, whether it's a private event or if it's just like a flyer that you're posting somewhere publicly and you want more people to see it. Um, those QR codes can obviously be really helpful for that. Just to show you, I copied that link out. And if we open up an incognito so that I'm logged out and go to that link, it'll go straight to uh, the registration page for this particular event. So a volunteer you know, who follows that link or who scans that QR code would go straight to the registration page for that particular event. Now, something else I wanna talk about kind of in that vein is if you are creating something like a flyer uh, or maybe you're sending out an invite through a particular person and you want to track how successful that campaign was, whether it was a flyer, or maybe you have some volunteers who are inviting uh, groups of volunteers through their church or through one of their groups or schools or something like that, and you wanna track, okay, well, how successful was that engagement or you know, how many people did that person wind up actually recruiting? In service, you can use something called source tracking to identify how many people have signed up using a particular link. So I still have that invite link 
copied. So I'm going to go ahead and go to that page here. And you can see uh, this link, uh, if we were to break this down, we see like uh, basically the registration uh, code for this particular event. But if I go to this URL, I can also add a source. So I'm going to do ampersand source equals, and we could say flyer or something like that. And then if I send this link out to my volunteers, it will tack on a registration source. So anyone who signs up using this particular link would be identified as having signed up through the flyer in this case, right? Or maybe I want to use a particular person's name or a school name or, you know, whatever. You can use all sorts of different things here, but that would basically add this as an identifier um, to the registration itself. So you can run reports on how many people signed up using this particular uh, source or kind of see that information. So there's a couple things you can do with this. Obviously I could just send the link as is, um, but one thing that you can do in service, I just copied that link here, is if we are logged into the admin side of the system, if you paste a URL into the search bar here, the system will ask you if you want to generate a QR code using that. So now I have a QR code that has that flyer source added to it. And of course I could go and add this to a flyer, and then that would track how many people actually signed up through that particular flyer. There's one more thing that I want to point out in regards to this. We have talked about source tracking in the past, but there's been an addition to that where you can, uh, in the system configuration under system settings, you can tell the system to tag new volunteers who are created via source tracking, and it would essentially just add whatever the source was to the person's profile as a tag. And those are internal volunteers don't see that, but that way you could actually identify pretty quickly how many new accounts were created via that source tracked link. All right. Well, we're gonna switch gears here a little bit to talk about some of the kind of technical aspects of what we were looking at with web integration. Um, so I want to point out a couple articles that are available to you. If you go to support.servicetech.com and search for website or integration, you'll see this document. So integrating service into your existing website. This document is intended to be a resource. Uh, what you'll see if we scroll through this is just kind of notes and information about what you need and then essentially copy and paste for iframes or if we scroll further down uh, for standalone links. Uh, so if you wanna get different links to your console or if you want to embed different pages into your website, um, that's kind of what this document is intended for. If you have questions about what does all of this mean or how do I use this, I would encourage you to reach out to our customer support team and set up a web integration uh, conversation with our training team. Uh, that way you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about how do you accomplish this. It's really pretty straightforward, but if you know what you're doing, this article contains kind of all the information that you might need. One very important aspect to this that I want to point out, we don't need to dig into right now, but you might want to explore later, is the idea of creating a custom domain. Uh, if you haven't already done this, you will know that when you're looking at your login page because it will say the URL will be www.servicetech.com. You might also have a custom subdomain that might be, you know, foodbank.servicetech.com or, you know, your kind of URL.servicetech.com. But if you have a full custom domain, uh, this would not say service tech at all. It would be your URL here. Uh, the benefit of doing that is kind of twofold. When volunteers are looking at your links, they don't see a service tech URL, they see your URL. Uh, and then also when you are embedding service into your website, that just ensures that there won't be any issues. So there's some information about how to set up a custom domain through here, and that is a pretty important precursor to this uh, in terms of embedding service into your website. But otherwise, this article just kind of contains all the resources that you might need. Uh, most of this is copy and paste with a little bit of replacement for different things. Um, but one of the things that we looked at today uh, in kind of applying those filters, creating all the filters on the right-hand side here, uh, this was all actually done using variables uh, that we have kind of set up for this type of web integration. So if you were to play around with this link, which we can actually send this in the chat, uh, you're welcome to go to this page and sort of play around with it. 
you'll notice that all of these buttons on the right hand side go back to this same page. It's this embed example, but they just have a variable tacked on to the end that tells the page to load something different. Um, and those variables can all be found in this article. So we have an article set that's titled Website Integration Variables. Uh, and this basically just lays out what are all the variables that you can use uh, and what do they do and are there other things you can kind of tack on to them, right? So uh, this is just kind of laying out the different options to you. Obviously, if you have any questions about this as you're utilizing it, please contact our customer support team. It is relatively straightforward in terms of implementing it, uh, but the benefit of using those is, so like this entire implementation that I've showed you on our website takes place really on uh, this page. Really, there's just one page where the iframe itself is embedded and all of these filters over here, whether I'm filtering by an interest category or by a tag or by a zip code or whatever, all of that's taking place on the same page, essentially. Um, I, the variables are just telling the page to load something in particular. So again, this is pretty technical, but it's also relatively straightforward. This is service specific. It's not something that you'll find kind of in use all over the place, um, at least as written. But if you do have questions about it, please feel free to contact our customer support team. Um, the, you know, they're obviously happy to help you with this kind of information. And then I mentioned earlier as well that we do offer a uh, web integration meeting if you haven't already conducted that. So please feel free to uh, reach out to our support team to schedule that kind of conversation if you want some more one-on-one -on -one time to kind of walk through what does this process look like. Um, but again, the, the point of this conversation today and kind of the takeaway is that, you know, there are ways for you to simplify the onboarding process in terms of how you direct your volunteers uh, that can make it easier for them to see and sign up for what is relevant to them. Um, so you're, the, what we talked about at the beginning in terms of how you're directing volunteer steps, you know, what you ask them to see initially, what you ask them to sign up for initially, this highly depends on what kind of relationship you have with your volunteers and what next steps you have for them, whether it's direct registrations or an application and approval process where you're checking references and background checks and things like that. Um, but the pages that you display to your volunteers on your website uh, should kind of be driven by that process with your volunteers. Um, and really to the best of your ability, I think it will benefit you to simplify that so that volunteers are kind of clicking through steps rather than reading instruction sets. Um, Cause I think oftentimes that can just lead to more confusion if there's too many instructions rather than just having uh, buttons for volunteers to click on. Okay. Well, our team was answering questions throughout the call. Um, and if you have any other questions on top of what we have covered today, of course, please feel free to reach out to our customer support team. Uh, you can email support at servicetech.com or you can, when you're logged into your account, use the need help button at the bottom of the page to engage with our customer support team through there. Um, as I mentioned at the top, you can also interact with all of our previously recorded webinars. If you go to video.servicetech.com, uh, you can also just go to YouTube and search for service technologies. You'll find that those resources there. Uh, and that will do it for today. I wanna thank you all for your time. It is a pleasure to see you in the chat. I know I've met with a lot of you directly. So thank you again for joining. We are looking forward to seeing how you take and apply this knowledge to streamlining your volunteer onboarding process and connecting with your volunteers more readily. Uh, so as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, connect up with us. I'm gonna leave uh, the webinar open just briefly to make sure some questions get answered that were more unique to certain individuals. So if you do have more questions, feel free to write those in, uh, but that'll conclude kind of our discussion for today. So thanks for your time and hope you have a great rest of your week.